Hi everyone, my name is Royce and I'm a first year MD-PhD student at UPenn. In this video I'm going to be talking about five factors that you should consider when you're constructing your medical school list and also provide specific advice for those who are applying to MD programs and those who are applying to MD-PhD programs. Let's get started. It might seem appealing to want to apply to 40 schools because after all, the more schools you apply to, the more chances you have of getting interviews and therefore acceptance spots, right? But of course there's a trade-off here. And the trade-off is that the more schools you apply to, the more time and money you lose as well. It's gonna take a lot of time to write those secondaries. That leads to a trade-off in the quality of the secondaries that you produce. And so you're gonna be applying to more schools, but your application is not gonna be as good. And of course, each application has an application fee associated with it, and applying to 40 schools just sounds extremely expensive for no reason. So my recommendation is to apply to around 15 schools if you can help it and apply to 30 at most. Of course, this is a rule of thumb. You know, I'm just one random opinion on the internet, uh, and I think you should consult, you know, professionals on this issue. That includes your pre-health advisors, and make sure that they approve of it too. And another thing to note is that it's really hard to see factors like student culture, for example, uh, without actually visiting the school first. So the five factors that I'll be talking about in this video will be focused mostly on what you can see at this stage in your application cycle. So the first thing I want to talk about is the match list. The match list simply refers to uh, the list of the graduating students at a given medical school and the residency programs that they're matching to. At first thought, it makes sense to look at the match list because after all, aren't you just looking at, you know, directly the outcomes that the students at the medical school have? Um, but really, I would encourage you to not look at that primarily. There's a lot that goes into a match list that you just don't know about. So for example, you might be discouraged if you don't see 20 people at a given medical school matching into neurosurgery at Harvard. Uh, and the bottom line is that, you know, there might not be people in that medical school class who want to do neurosurgery and have that lifestyle. And there might not be people uh, who want to match to Harvard and want to live in Boston, for example. So the first real factor that you should consider is the GPA and the MCAT at the school. So maybe unfortunately, these stats in particular uh, severely limit your school list, how competitive you'll be at a given school. You can find this information on MSAR. This is an online tool that you have to pay for, but I highly recommend that you get because it'll strongly help you in creating your school list. So when you're looking at a given school, you want to look at their median MCAT and their median GPA. Uh, and so a school will be considered in range for you if your MCAT falls within plus or minus two at a given school and your GPA falls within plus or minus 0.1 at a given school. Schools where your GPA and MCAT are below this range, that school should be considered a reach school for you. So on the flip side, if your stats are above these ranges for a given school, that school should be considered a safety for you. And so when you're constructing your medical school list, you're gonna to wanna to get five or 10 schools that are in range for you, five schools that are reach for you, and five schools that are safeties. So this should total to around 15 or 20 schools, if my math is correct. The next factor is location. My recommendation is to apply to all of your in-state public schools. And that's because your in-state public schools offer uh, a preference for students who are in their states. So they'll offer higher rates of admission and they'll also offer lower tuition as well. So for example, UC schools, they tend to have a strong regional bias. There's a disproportionately high number of medical students in their student body who are California residents. And also they offer reduced tuition to California residents as well. So keep in mind that private schools, for example, like USC, University of Southern California, they're not really related to the state government. So they don't have this regional bias and they don't offer reduced tuition uh, based on geography alone. So again, I recommend you apply to all of your in-state public schools. So when you're looking at your other schools in your school list, uh, location does play a role, but it's definitely a much smaller role. And I say that because medical school is four years long and you wanna make sure that you'll feel comfortable living in that location. So if you don't wanna live in a small town, you don't have to, and you can decide that based on your school list. The next thing I wanna talk about is clinical opportunities. And by this, I mean, you know, things like uh, global health initiatives, community clinics, student run clinics. If you're interested in serving the Latinx population, then you could uh, look for Latinx serving clinics at a given school. So for example, at Penn and in the Philadelphia area, there's Puente de Salud. And that's a great opportunity for students who wanna practice serving the Latinx population and practice using medical Spanish to aid in their care. 
So if you have a specific interest in rural medicine, definitely look for schools that offer clinical rotations in rural areas. The next factor is research. Um, so of course, you don't need to do basic science research. You know, medical students I know match to great places and they don't do basic science research. Uh, and that's fine if it doesn't interest you. If basic science research isn't your cup of tea, you could look at clinical research opportunities or public health research. Now the fifth factor I want to cover is curriculum. Honestly, this probably isn't a huge factor. So whether a school is systems-based learning or group-based learning, you're still going to be a great doctor at the end of the day. Now I would say uh, pay attention to these kinds of things if you in fact have a very specific style of learning. Otherwise, I, I don't see it as probably a huge factor for most people. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and give a few pieces of advice to those who are applying to MD-PhD programs. So of course, if you're applying MD-PhD, research is the most important factor. Make sure you have at least three PIs at a given school that you could see yourself working with. It's definitely a commonality in academia for PIs to be recruited elsewhere. Another big factor is location. Make sure you find a city that you really want to live in because you'll probably be living there for eight years or more and there's a good chance that you'll buy a house there too. So another thing you want to consider is the features of the MD-PhD program. So even if the medical school itself is, you know, quote unquote, a good medical school, uh, the MD-PhD program might not be an emphasis at that school. I'm just going to propose here a few features that you can look at. So the first one is integration of the MD and the PhD training. Uh, this includes early research uh, lab rotations uh, in your MD years or early clinical training. This can include longitudinal clinical training throughout your PhD years. So keep in mind as a physician scientist, you want to essentially blend science and medicine together in a harmonious way. And so you want a training that reflects that. Another feature is that you can see if there are a lot of MD-PhD faculty at the school. This can be a reflection of you know, just how supportive the school is of MD-PhDs and of physician scientists as a concept. And also these MD-PhD faculty can serve as role models. And uh, there's never such thing as too many role models. These MD-PhD faculty will be available to you as mentors, uh, formal or informal. So another factor is program size. So UPenn has the largest MD-PhD program in the country. Uh, my MD-PhD cohort in particular has over 35 people. Um, and so that's nice because it means you have more friends who are on this extremely long journey with you. And it also means that uh, the MD-PhD program tends to accept more students and admit more students. Another factor is flexibility and training. You know, eight years is a huge chunk of your life. Um, if you're 24 going into the MD-PhD program, that's like a third more of your life. It might be nice to have the flexibility to uh, you know, choose when you go to lab or when you return to the clinics um, or take a leave of absence. And that's because, you know, life happens. So one final thing to consider is the F30 and F31 grant success rates. F30 and F31 grants are grants that MD-PhD students can apply to uh, in their fourth year of training. And uh, the success rate reflects, you know, just how well the students and the MD-PhD programs prepare these grants. And honestly, low-key, it might also reflect the prestige that uh, the MD-PhD program has with the NIH. And that's basically it for this video. If you found it helpful, please like and subscribe. Thanks, and I'll see you later.